the Creative Underground, and we are interviewing today, we're uh, pleased to have with us today, uh, Carolyn Biggio, and she had the privilege of being one of uh, the students of Hawthorne and Henshi. And just to uh, give you a little bit of uh, background about these painters, um, I'm showing you some pictures here of, this is a painting of Hawthorne's. Uh, here is another painting of Hawthorne's. And uh, these great artists um, helped to develop what was later to be called the Cape Cod uh, School of Art. Uh, this is a Henshi painting and another one. As you can see, the, these gentlemen had a way of seeing light, luminous light, in a, in a way that um, other artists hadn't seen before. And, and then Carolyn had the opportunity to learn under these uh, mentors, and and we'll see how it affected her painting and her life. So, with no further ado, Carolyn, uh, why don't you tell us about your experience, your personal experience about these two great painters? Because you know they're not here with us today, and we'd like no. to know a little more about them. Well, Charles Hawthorne, he died in 1930, so I. I did not have the privilege of working directly under him, but his uh, best student probably and, and the teacher that carried on his school was Henry Henshi. Henshi changed the name to Cape School of Art after, after Hawthorne died. But in, and there were some other students of Hawthorne's that branched out and opened schools, but Henshi is really the one that most people feel like followed uh, in Hawthorne's footsteps. And what Hawthorne had tried to do, and he died fairly young age, I think he was 58. Uh, so he would have maybe done more adventure into this progression of Impressionism, which uh, Henshi ended up taking that mantle on himself. And, and he, people do feel, and I feel like he took what the Impressionists, and by Impressionists, we look really looking at Monet's work with atmosphere and light and color. And he progressed that, and he worked all through the 20th century. He, he painted and taught over 70 years. Wow. I was able to meet him. I was 27, and I was living in um, southern Louisiana in a town called Homa, and I had studied science in school. I had not studied any painting. I didn't, I'm very ignorant about painting, but I'd always been one of those kids that liked to draw and stuff. And so a friend was taking art lessons out at Studio One, which was a small art studio, really an old house, sitting on the Bayou side, as they say down here, by Bayou Lafouche, outside of Thibodeau. And I, I said, great, I'll sign up for eight lessons. That was going to be my birthday present. And you know, when people say something happens in your life that and, and you can pinpoint a moment when your life was different after that, my life was different after I signed up for those lessons and went out there. And I'm not saying that I became a super great artist, but it changed my life because I, from what I learned by seeing Henchy's work and all the people around him and, and studying him now, I mean, it, it, it changed the course of my life and that I, it enriched my life, et cetera. But I will tell you, when I went out there for my lessons. I appreciate that because, uh, you know, we all are affected by art every day in, in, in many ways, and, and sometimes we don't appreciate it, but uh, it's it's amazing when it impacts someone's life like it had yours, and uh, maybe gave you focus and a vision for what you wanted to do, I'm guessing. But. Yes, and not so much as I'm going to become this great artist and sell all these paintings and I'm going to be super, you know, famous or anything like that. It was It's about uh, your own awareness in the world and Oh, you know, everything I learn about art stems from that time when I met them, those people, mm -hmm. and Henshi. And what happened was I went into the little studio, which is this very modest building. I assume it's still there. It may, may not be there anymore. 
it was a little brick building on the side of the bayou and I went in there and they had paintings the, the all the walls were white hung with a uh, pegboard and they had paintings everywhere and most of them student work and I just couldn't believe some of the colors I was seeing especially one painting was in the back of the room and I went back there I was thinking now how could anyone see all of these colors in the bayou outside you know it just it's not there the, the bayou is brown you know why why has it got all these colors and that was one of Henchy's paintings that they happened to have there now while I was, how did they see the color I mean how how, how, I mean, you know what? It's interesting, Daryl. It is the color. That's the thing. That is the key to hand. It's not making up a color, or it is actually seeing that that is the color I'm seeing. Right. Searching for it on your palette, mixing it into your your um, canvas, and it, it is that color. I have a story. One time, I had people at my house, and and some girl said, "Oh, I love that painting, but how do you make up that color in the shadow there?" And I said. Well, that is the color I see, and she but, said, "No, it's but, but, but it is." But the problem is, is that most people don't see those colors, and um, exactly they need to learn to see the color. Um, I was That's taught to see it by what I call scanning, and uh, moving your eyes, your head a little bit to the left and the right, and then out of the side of your eye, all of a sudden this color illuminates, and and it's that's what you paint, but. Most of the time when you're looking, if you're not scanning, your eyes aren't picking up that luminous color. You're picking up a, a darker, grayer color. Is that the way that they, how did he teach you to, to see those? Okay, colors? well, I can tell you what happened is after a number of lessons, I came and then Henry showed up. He wasn't there right when I got in there. It was Dottie Ballou was her name, Dorothy Ballou. She ran the art studio. She ended up being Henchy's second wife. She was a good artist herself. Well, what the way he taught was to set up simple still life objects, and I mean really simple, like they had colored blocks of wood. Right. You know, just because to take out all the distraction of trying to make, if you were to have a model of a horse or something, I mean, or anything, it was blocks of wood uh, painted. You might have a red block of wood next to a white block of wood, and maybe a blue bottle or dish next to that. Very simple. Um, subjects and you just concentrated on what the color was what the real color is that you see and you would paint outside and then bring that well how he taught me was because I would get there after work late in the afternoon we would put something outside and I work on it for a little while just making crude notes of color net one next to the other and then I would bring those same objects inside and put them under an electric light and paint them and boy you can see a big difference if you're really looking for the color that little still life you did outside is totally different even though it's the same objects as what you're doing under the electric light inside one thing I went out there one time when I was very new at it and actually Henry wasn't there but his daddy was there and she had to set these still life objects outside and it was a blue board, a blue block and something else. And boy, I thought I had it perfect. You know, mine, they think the three students that were there, we brought them inside and I'm thinking, well, I've got dark blue and light blue. I've got, mine looks really good. And one of the ladies had like these all smudgy looking purplish, some kind of color for the shade note of the, of the thing. And I thought, well, she's going to say hers is really bad, you know, or something. <laughs> and uh, as Dottie was talking about it and talking about the colors you should be looking for. What are you looking for here? Um, I went back outside and because of course she praised that one. And I, but when I went back outside and I looked at it, that, that one was way more closer to what really was there than what I had done. And that kind of thing happened a lot. You, if you really, we were painting, I had a painting of a water pitcher. It was pink. Okay, so I had like a darker pink in the shade note. And either Dottie or Henry walked by and said, why do you have that dark pink in there? And I said, well, it's in the shade, you know, it's in the shadow. And they said, but it's not, that's not the right color. And she went and got a black cloth and put behind it, behind the, the picture that I was painting. And sure enough, and I thought to myself, well, they think I have to find every color that's really on the thing I mean that's what I'm supposed to be doing I really didn't understand until she they said that so it's really teaching yourself to see 
those colors, not make any assumptions. To right. work on one still life after another, one little object thing after another. And, and you really do eventually see. Yeah, the this, once you see it, the problem is actually putting it down in paint. That's the other problem. Yeah, I, I see with students that they uh, a lot of times uh, think they're rushing to it and will come up with the right color. And, uh, and, and in the beginning, as it was for me and at yourself and everybody else, there is that time where you think you got it, hey, 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 and then all of a sudden you realize, whoa, I, I don't quite get this yet. And right. it, it humbles us. We're always humbled, I think, when we paint. And then we awaken to the right idea, and, and it takes time, uh, a lot of attention, and discipline because like you said hey I gotta find this right color I gotta find that right color I gotta find that next color this is gonna wear me out wait I didn't sign up for this I want something either easier I want to splash paint around I want to pretend I'm an artist and uh, well you know, and you know it's something a else he employed I'm sorry he employed was you used a palette knife and I still use a palette knife for a lot of paintings and that's one of the things that Henshi put forth, and Haw it came from Hawthorne. I read some some writings of Hawthorne writing a letter to his wife in the early 19-something or others, because he had taken a trip to Europe and seen the, the work of Franz Hals, and he wanted to try to paint, you know, because he was, uh, the way he modeled faces and everything, and, and he said, no, oh, I can't even do that. I'm getting too carried away with the brush strokes. I'm gonna get back to first principle and paint with the palette knife. And you know, when you paint with a palette knife, especially if when you're first starting out it is a good idea because you tend to use more paint you can clean the thing in between you don't get that muddy brush you know you can you get clean color right. and and how they have you start and I've seen people struggle with starts is you make your best your best guess at this color mass and then you move on to the next one you can't sit there and dwell and dwell dwell on it did I get the right color on that thing make your best guess at that crude note of color see like a child you know don't think it's an apple it's got to be red you know it may not be red depending on what's around it you know so make your best guess at that color move on to something that's next to it and next to it and next to it and you'll come back and and you'll refine that color the one you first put down and then you make more comparisons that's how I remember Henshi working if you put down you make comparison to that next note you put down you say oh that's not right you know I can see that's not right so you make your comparison and and try to break up that note into the different then start to make your differences that you see in the note with the reflected light and you know the uh, cast and yeah the I, I didn't know about um, either of these gentlemen until I, I, I was teaching a painting workshop across the country and at one of my workshops one of the ladies said the reason she wanted to learn this was because she liked you know the Cape Cod school and then she was the one that actually turned me on to this and and then I started reading all the books out there and there's there is lots of information out there for artists to get uh, and the way that they block in the color like you were talking about go for the the larger shapes of color and that but that's when I opened my eyes to this and then I started seeing other painters that were using it but maybe they weren't all giving maybe credit back to uh, Hawthorne and Henshi and um, and I, I like the with anything, it's always good to go back to the roots of something and, and see what it meant. And, and that's why I think it's going to be interesting for people today uh, to see how the uh, their paintings and their technique was able to influence your paintings. I want to go back to these um, things that we were sharing earlier. And I want to share these paintings and let you talk about them a little bit more. Um, we're gonna go back to the top one here. This one was a Hawthorne painting. Um, can, can you tell me about that? I mean, just- Well, my, I believe it's probably a demo he was doing for a class study. That's, you know, I don't know that for a fact, but it looks like something like that, where he would set a model to get people away from details and just think about atmosphere 
uh, what's in shade, what's in light. Keep those masses separate. And it looks like he made some, of course, differences within those masses in this picture. And that probably was a demonstration. There's a lot of examples of student work, uh, this type of model posing. Um, it got people outside, so you can see, you know, it's not studio work. You're out there painting with the sunlight. So I, I think that's what that is. And Hawthorne was trying to further along the Impressionism. Impressionists had come into the, all the artists in America had seen it. It was even more accepted in America than it was in Europe. And, and the colors, and I believe he was trying to figure out a way to teach people to see, to see the colors and to get them on their board. And of course, Henchy, following in his footsteps, actually was able to, to teach the method better than, than Hawthorne did. I mean, they, they really use very simple color. Uh, you know, they don't overwork an area. They don't try to like add 20 colors into an area. Um, yes. They don't over detail anything. It, right. It, right. It's more general. Yes. Now you can find well. They they become in the in the paintings where they uh, where I know Hanchi's work when he would get time to work on a say a north light still life over the whole winter and then he'd work on it and work on it and work on it. His paintings could get very refined, you know, uh, but still not lose that. The beautiful color, you know. So some of the work, the work we're looking at right now, right here, and I think the examples we have are are maybe not as except maybe the landscape looks like of Henchy's that was more further, uh, you know, what you might say a finished painting versus a, a, a study. And that's another thing they considered. Well, Henchy, to me, every painting's a study mm -hmm. in your education as a painter. It should never be. I, I always, if I ever go to a workshop. I used to go to a lot of workshops, and people want seem like they wanted a finished painting by the end of the workshop. When everything should be treated as a study, to I hopefully you improve and you improve, and you can grow with your mistakes. And um, that that's yeah. I got out of it. I totally agree with that. I mean, this painting of of the uh, lighthouse. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful lost edges. Yes. And then he builds up to the sharp edges and the darks at the at the peak of the lighthouse. Um, you get the whole image, and it's and it's beautifully painted. Um, I, I love the light in it. Yes. I, th I think that as we go into Henshi, though, which is the next picture I'll I'll, I'll bring up, we see that the, that he's get he's understanding the luminous color a little bit more maybe yeah. than uh, Hawthorne does. And uh, he he was doing the, you know that scanning that I talked about to pick up the colors. Um, this is a, a demo piece, I'm sure. It's not a finished. Uh, you know, it's it's something he worked on probably a couple of times. He I have a lot of photographs. Many people do. I'm not the only person that knows everything about Henchy or anything about Henchy. But you no. know, he he gave demos. Just you know, and that came from the. Uh, Hawthorne School at Provincetown. They once a week they give a, a a demo for the students, and and Chase had done that at Shinnecock, and uh, so this was probably I'm assuming this I guess this was probably set up, and he was probably doing a demo in front of a bunch of students. And is is this a watercolor or is this oil? Oh, that's an oil. Still painted with a painting knife. That oh. could be brushes because um, that that. He did a lot of demos with brushes, and I'm, I'm not saying that he always worked with a knife, a palette knife. He did work with a palette knife, and he's, the student work starts always with a palette knife, as far as I know. I don't know if anyone would contradict that, but as far as I know, the students would start with palette knives. This now, is he, another landscape painting. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people are out there trying to paint those trees, and they're using the, their greens. Yes. We have yellows and... Uh, magentas or purples what's that all about i mean how did that happen well you have to be able to see it to have it happen <laughs> and um you know that take took years and years of study for him and i believe that's probably his chinese elmi painted behind his house 
many, many times. And you can tell, I, it, at least to me, that looks like an evening scene, the, the color of the light, the quality of light. You know, just the idea of studying these kind of paintings. And I just noticed light all the time now. I sit out, I mean, this has been going on for a long time, but, you know, I sit outside at night or in the morning, and I'm looking at the light thinking, yeah, it is kind of pink, and or it's orange, or it's, you know, it just, and that's one of my paintings, but really, it's hard to compare. <laughs> well, so, you know, what we're trying to kind of understand here is, you know, how does their uh, painting and their teaching affect you? Uh, we have this one, and I'll go through the other uh, two that we have too. We'll actually have two here. There's uh, some little eight by tens. Um, those well, are a lot closer to the luminous color that I saw with some of the yeah, sketches. That yeah. They now, the other paintings by an indoor light, and so is this little one at the end with the. With these two paintings are painted out. Were painted outside. And yeah, you can tell when something's painted inside. outside versus inside. Now that's inside by. Um, uh, studio light you know just light um but yeah, again you can see like in this humble painting here um things you learn I, a lot of people learn this stuff i'm not the only one but that like the cylinder you make your shape by by showing the light the mid-tone and the shade side and a cast shadow and those are simple things that you can just any beginning student can think of where I'm this thing this vase is sitting in light obviously or I wouldn't be able to see it okay so it has a light side it has a dark side or the shade side and then there's something in the middle and here you can see you can see that greenish color I've got there that you have to have at least three differences to make it look like it's going around um, those are things you can pick up on and this painting is not super refined or anything but you can see those three changes in those three areas on that base and it tends to start making it look like a cylinder that I get that's everything I get I, I saying came from those pieces. well I like even the the shapes in the shadow of the horse uh, yeah. and, and their colors that I would have never thought in my mind to put there those purples and oranges and then that green there but it breaks it up and it sets that color in space perfectly. Yeah. So, uh, well, you have to look for, you know, if you really look at the thing, and that's a white uh, little statue, you're going to see the red, you know, a way to look at it. If you have a, um, put a white bowl outside and put something red next to it, and then look at that, what that red does to that white object, and then take it away. Boy, you'll see it then. You'll see, well, wait a minute, that was a whole different color. When you move the red next to it again, wow, there's red in that white. I mean, you can really, when it's something bold like that, you can really see it. And maybe that's another reason he used those those colored blocks. You can really get people to see what one color does to another color when it's next to it. It's kind of an experiment, isn't it? It is, the whole thing, yeah. And they say that... Henchy was trying to, he had become assistant to Hawthorne and he was with the students' work and went maybe set up still as and someone mentioned to him, and I, we don't know the name of the person, someone from Philadelphia, they say, said about the blocks, the colored blocks. And after that, which was probably sometime in the 20s, um, Henchy employed that idea and Hawthorne was for it too because it, it does make you not focus on oh I have this pretty vase oh it's got all kind of decoration on it I got to get all that done you know so instead of that this, right. this simplifies the whole idea and you're just looking for color and that really is what he was about to, you know that you would learn to see color it's enough <laughs> it, that's, and then once you see it then the next step is trying to get your paint to see you know show it with paint and the atmosphere that you know envelops the whole scene, and of course he did that. There are some of Henchy had students, you know, for many years, and many of them are still alive and painting. And I wish I had been one of those students that met him in the '60s. I, I, I'm, I think he probably was in his prime in the '60s or '70s, but I unfortunately was, I know I wasn't there. But there are some painters now, and some of them are really good. And you can really, 
you can really appreciate their work um, for how it even you know it shows what Henshi was all you about. Think that his students were better than him, or no, I I don't think, and I don't think he was about who's better or who. No, it, I mean, but sometimes it, people say that if, some people say that if you teach, then you know you're not really able to do it. But you know, the no, he, guys were teaching, and, and I, I'm finding out that through history, those painters that taught us something are the ones that really stand out for us, you know, uh, Leonardo, yeah. you know, Cezanne. I mean, every one of these painters, whenever you can teach us something new, that that's when you're going to stand out. Otherwise, you're just clapping along the with influence. everybody else, you know. And so... Right. I would think he had a way of, of making you feel, and I, I believe there's some writing and quotes from him about, you know, what once he unleashes the idea to you that what you need to do is learn to see, and then put that on the canvas the best as you can, your own voice is going to show up, your own unique voice with this seeing and painting. It's really not about... Uh, painting like Monet or oh I'm gonna be the next right. Henry Henshi. It's really about seeking your own best way forward. And that's another thing I really liked about his the whole thing, the whole style and everything, I guess you could call it a style or the the progression that he saw and, right. and taught to taught people was that it is all about your own journey in this and how you can get better. It, it's Yeah, I, I, I like that because um you know, you can see where some of the painters um, painted a little bit more like them and then veered off a little to the left and the right. But then there were some other painters that were associated with him. Was it Dickens? What was his name? Oh, Dickinson. He that was, was a dramatic archer from, like, what they Now, he never studied with Henchy, but he did study with Hawthorne. He studied with him, she, I mean, uh, Chase and a little bit, and then Hawthorne, and then he went off on his own way, yeah, definitely, and uh, painted nothing like this Impressionist. You can find some evidence in his work where he may have been with the influence of Hawthorne, uh, some of his objects and, and things, but he really became a symbolist, and a, a, not a surrealist, people call him, but... But there was still an appreciation there between the two of Hawthorne and Dickinson. They traded paintings. You know, they there was no, oh, you have to follow my way right. or the highway. That, that's now, rich. That's now, rich. Henshi was not shy about uh, saying who he did have some disdain for. I mean, he had a lot of problems with all the different isms that came along in the 20th. I mean, he lived through all that and stuck to what he saw as the progression of art. Uh, you know, so he wasn't, a, you might say, the biggest fan of the abstract expressionist or But then that's his right. That was his opinion. That's his right to say. So he, he did not agree with all of that. <laughs> If, if you were going to take a stab at it and just like, in your opinion, it doesn't really, it's just your, your opinion, but okay. what do you think from your experience of, of these painters um, and maybe their old school approach or actually their very innovative approach, um, what do you think maybe we've lost in, in the art of painting that these guys had that we should try to regain? Well, I think, and, and this is my humble opinion, yeah. art has progressed to, it's more about installation and um, some grand idea or, you know, what's, is, what angst am I trying to show with this painting or I'm trying to make a statement about something going on in the country. They weren't about that. It was about the beauty of the world and around you and a visual poem and mm -hmm. uh, maybe... A, a revisiting of the easel painting and just trying to uh, create a beautiful subject for people to enjoy that might seem old school. I think there's still a lot of people that are doing that. I mean, you see beautiful works by people, yeah. but the, 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 and when you see all the publicity or whatever I read about art, it seems to be more along the lines of, you know, the next big thing and can I make a giant dog that sculpture that has you know shrubbery on it is that is that really 
it, I guess it's art to somebody, I guess. Our art is what it cool. is. But, but I think uh, Henshi would be more ha would be happier to see his ideas progressing. He would be happy, I'm sure, to see people go beyond what he did to create beautiful works for people to enjoy. And you know. yeah, I, like, I like the art of painting, and uh, I, I, I believe that uh, painting is its own visual language. So when I try to make it somehow political or about a statement or save this or save that, I think it sometimes hangs too much weight on the painting. And most times when I see those paintings, I, I don't get it because I'm not seeing it with the visual language. So yeah. I guess kind of the challenge I give to those painters that are seeing those things is, you know, don't try to hang the words on it. Put it in the paint, put it in the painting. and. Uh, my gosh, it would be so much more uh, impactful. And um, I think, like I said, it's its visual language is its own language. We don't need to encumber it, but that's yeah. sidebar. <laughs> yeah, and I think I went back to school a few years ago, age 49. I went back and he said I wanted to study about art history because I was still ignorant about it, you know, and I went back and I got a degree in art history. And meanwhile, in that, Time I had to take all the classes, you know, the life drawing classes and the painting and everything with these kids that are 18 and I enjoyed every minute of it. But they didn't press you in art school to, uh, in fact, one teacher said one time, it's not enough to just paint something that's beautiful. You have to have some message behind it. You have to have some kind of thing that goes with it. So you, you almost have to make up a story, you know. <laughs> It wasn't enough, and I don't. I think that gets impressed upon the next generation. And I can tell. I don't think Henshi held, held in great esteem the, um, you know, the the art, uh, academic art, you know, in colleges, and because yeah. they thought it had gotten away from teaching people how to create the beautiful paintings that uh, he learned how to do. Well, he had such groundbreaking teaching that, you know, had, both of them that hadn't really been done before. And along the lines of the Impressionist or Monet, uh, as you had mentioned, and helping people to see, even come to uh, creating an approach for people. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there, there's a number of books out there that people can go out and see, read, talking about the approach. But um, also, I know that you, you have been trying uh, to put your memoirs or thoughts together about a book. And how's that going? Well, I have written a manuscript, I call it, and it's just, I really started it for me because I wanted to find out, well, where was my place in art history? Not that I belong written in art history books, but just where was I sitting here? Because I had heard that, you know, well, Henshi had learned from Hawthorne, Hawthorne learned from Mer William Merritt Chase, and Chase had studied with Monet. Well, when I started studying any of that, Chase did not study with Monet because really, no, he was didn't teach, really. He didn't, he, so Chase had seen the Impressionist work that had been brought into the country, and his palette lightened, and as they say, he became American Impressionist, although not enhancing all ideas of Impressionism. But his palette lightened and he taught outdoor at the outdoor school and um, I wanted to study about these people um, Chase I didn't know anything about William Merritt Chase and there's a lot of information available to us was to, available to me to anyone who wants to look for it in the Smithsonian Archives of American Art if you want to delve into these painters the way I, I did and I put it down in writing I have because I thought they were all great educators also William Merritt Chase Robert Henry was a Chase student and he was about the same contemporary he was a contemporary of Hawthorne so I kind of uh, and he was known to be a good teacher so I wrote about him and I studied about him and then um, Dickinson I found very interesting as we mentioned Edwin Dickinson as another student of Hawthorne and chases and he veered off such a different way I, I thought that was interesting and then Henshi of course the one that I knew 
So I wrote about all three of these men. All, oh, what is five men? <laughs> anyway, but if you want information about any of these people, you can contact the Archives of American Art. You can go through your library. They can request microfilms. Wow. Uh, some of these people left oral histories. Henchy, there's a 52-page oral history available through the Archives of American Art. All you have to do is ask for it. Wow. Uh, there's one uh, from uh, Dickinson, I believe, too. You can get their scrapbooks are available through that. You can get it sent to your library and look at it in a microfilm. Anyway, that's what I did. I studied about them. I went up to Provincetown. I had never been to Provincetown. And there are paintings of Henchies and Hawthorns there, of course, and people who knew them still. There's still people around that knew them. And so it's very interesting to talk to these people. Dickinson, I was able to find his major patron uh, was a woman named Esther Hoyt Sawyer, and I managed to meet her son who and spend a day with him. And, you know, he had insights into Dickinson and, you know, of course, his mother, who was a big art patron. Um, so it's just I, right there, and it has enriched my life, just all of that. We traveled, we, we you know, just and go to the museums and find their works and anyway yes yeah, so I did put down all of this it's sitting here in my living room <laughs> but I enjoy it and I have shared well, it with some people I hope we I hope we get to see that sometime and it's very interesting a, a book that uh, you could share uh, your perspective on that and you know we all like to know where we fit in I'd, I'd like to figure where I fit in and so yeah, where do you fit in you know in in, in this weird art history thing you know where's where is it that's true that's true hey i want to thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your perspective and uh your experience your knowledge uh your paintings uh this has just been a really uh nice time and, and a great interview and uh well thank you daryl thank, thank you for you. asking me and hanging in there when i couldn't get on the google whatever it is hang out <laughs> <laughs> no, you did good. You did good. Okay. Well, thank you.